let me hit the recording button and yeah so welcome to the second session on topology or topology speedrun because we uh, we we avoid uh, going too deep into the madness so but yeah today we will actually be uh, delving a little bit deeper into the, the iceberg and specifically we'll be talking about two properties well one is nice and fairly simple and the other two are fairly important but also fairly abstract and specifically I'm talking about compactness and Hausdorff, the Hausdorff property. Now before actually telling what those, what those are, uh, it's probably good to actually at least give some intuition so for why we should care about it. So, And keep in mind that both of these properties have some other ramifications and other um, consequences than what I'm mentioning here, but at least the Hausdorff property, you can think of it as basically the, the, the fact that you can isolate any point with your topology. So, like, there is no point that you cannot really, any two points you can distinguish them using the using open set in your topology, and that means in particular for like for a metric topology that you can approximate any particular point and remember one point might be actually a function if you're trying to approximate functions so you can approximate any particular point to arbitrary precision and you there's no risk of you uh, like having two two points that you cannot distinguish using your topology and so Hausdorff is actually there's a lot more to it than that, but that's one when we think about it, and really uh, a lot of things break when you don't have Hausdorff. So really in machine learning, I guess, that's pretty much always the case that you're working with Hausdorff spaces. And uh, I think a, a friend told me uh, non-Hausdorff spaces are unholy, so we should avoid them. So yeah, Hausdorff is like simple, but also fairly important, so it's nice to actually uh, understand it. The other, the other one is compactness, and compactness is it's also really, really subtle and well, seemingly simple and really subtle. At least I know it, it took me quite a long time to like meditate on the like the, the meaning of compactness, um, and at least for for the purposes of, of like machine learning, compactness basically means that you can approximate yeah. things, and specifically that for any like degree of precision that you want, you can approximate. Whatever you're approximating, between being like whether it's a point, a function, a set, you can approximate it with finitely many objects or finitely many steps. So in some sense, like compactness is, is kind of like like computing. Like it's almost like something being computable, right? You you can, you, you can do some finite computation to get some decent approximation of your object. And actually, as an example of that. Uh, we have the universal approximation theorem for neural networks that says, okay, if I have some activation function which is continuous from the real numbers to the real numbers, and I, I'm not sure about why this is important, but actually it just has to be not a polynomial, then for any, uh, basically for any function, continuous function, on a compact support, so define on a compact set of some of, uh, Rn. So any function defined on this compact set, for any precision epsilon that we want, I can find basically a, a neural network with one hidden layer that is going to approximate this uh, function f as close within epsilon. So notice that this approximation result is about functions defined on some compact set and really that's not a it's not a coincidence like almost all uh, like universal approximation type results like for example you can approximate any continuous function using polynomials but as long as it's on a, a compact set and same thing for at least the, the first thing the first definition of Fourier it's about continuous functions and so you're only approximating on the, a compact set which is the, the, the period. So uh, also another way of thinking about uh, compactness is that you can sort of discretize it, you can discretize your space into smaller pieces and you you get a simple problem. 
so there's some, some form of recursion involved. So anyway, before we actually talk about um, Hausdorff and compactness, uh, let's quickly talk about uh, the notion of connectedness. So I think we, we all have some intuition about something being connected, like it should on, on only be one piece, there should be no, no, uh, like no, uh, yeah, you should, yeah, you could not, you should not be able to break your, your space into multiple pieces, it should be only one, so actually there's a formal definition of this in topology, and we say that a topological space is connected if we cannot write it as the union of two open sets that are on a not, not empty, of course, and that are disjoint. So, actually, fairly sort of straightforward, um, like definition of what I what, what, uh, what I was just saying. And okay, actually, one one uh, sort of uh, intuitive uh, form of this is so. There's a, we I think we talked last time about closed sets. So I said that is both open and closed. And the nice next characterization of uh, of a connected space uh, using that simply by saying that our x is connected if if and only if the only clopen sets are the empty set and x. So remember that the empty set and x are clopen by definition of a topology, and so it sort of makes sense that, uh, like we mentioned, that clopen sets are like the com the connected components of our of our spaces. And so this kind of makes sense. Uh, another uh, characterization, maybe a bit more uh, weird, is that okay, we, we st uh, discrete valued map is a function from x to d, where d is some discrete topological space. And I'm not sure if the definition mentioned that it should be continuous, but uh, like if, if you ignore the, the the fact that the continuous, I think don't think it makes sense. So uh, yeah, third characterization. Uh, sorry, yeah, uh, second characterization is that x is connected if every continuous discrete-valued map on x is constant. You can like go through the proof. It's reasonably simple. That really it can only be. Uh, sorry, it can only be um, uh, constant because if you had a map that were was not constant, you'd like the, the different values of the function would be identifying, identifying different connected pieces of your set. Okay, so one, one nice thing is that if I have a connected space and a fu continuous function from my connected space to some other topological space, then the image of my function is a connected subspace in Y. So connectedness is sort of preserved under continuous maps. Which is also why people, like, in sort of the intuition, intuitive definition of continu continuity, right, is that you cannot, or topology, is that you cannot tear or you cannot break things, right? Uh, so rubber sheet topology. So that's one. Uh, that's sort of one formal formalization of this notion of you cannot break things or you cannot tear things. And actually, the proof for that is very simple. Uh, simply by this. Uh, commutative diagram, right, I have, uh, because I can map x to uh, f of x for my map, continuous map, and take a discrete valued map, and of course d uh, composed with f is also a discrete valued map, which is constant because x is connected, and so of course d has to be constant too, uh, necessarily. Okay, so, final um, Property is that if I have a collection of connected subsets in X, and that each of these are non-disjoint, then of course I can take the union of those and get a connected set. Right. Also, don't hesitate to interrupt me because at least for connected components, it's not super hard, but the Hausdorff and compactness. It will, it will get a little bit hairier, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry? Okay, uh, so if we define this uh, equivalence relation that P and Q, so points in my topological space, belong to a, co a connected subset of X, so this is in fact an, an equivalence relation, 
and the equivalence classes of this relation are the connected components, sort of the, the largest um, connected subsets in my space. And so there are, they have some nice properties, like they're connected, obviously, and they're closed. And in fact, they're well, not necessarily open, but they're always closed at least. They contain all connected subsets, right? Because they're the, the largest connected subsets. They're disjoint. If they weren't, they they wouldn't be uh, different different uh, equivalence classes. And of course, they have to cover our, our whole space. That's because they're just equivalence classes. So of course, the, all the members of the equivalence classes must cover the original the original space. And so. If you wonder, I'm the blank here. I had something written here, but it wasn't important, so I removed it. So some further uh, here counter examples is that okay. Besides, even though we we talked about the the Clopen set, it turns out that actually connected components are not always open. So for example, the the set of rational numbers. Um, it, it, so it's only. Connected components are the singletons, right? Because it's always it's a dense subset of R, and because R has a larger cardinality, any any rational number is just isolated, just surrounded by real numbers. And so the only connected components of the rational numbers are just the singletons, and these are closed, but they're not open in the in the Euclidean topology, so they are closed but not open uh, connected subsets. But note that this is sort of a weird example of, of something that it sort of maybe goes a bit beyond what uh, what 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 one might what we think about when we think of connected components. But technically, it satisfies all the all the properties, so it counts. Another, maybe a bit more exa interesting example is um, so there's the definition of totally disconnected if the only connected subsets of X are singletons. So, for example, the rationals are totally disconnected, right, because every point is just separated from the others. And another example of a totally disconnected set, but that is actually uncountable, it's the Cantor set, so you, you may know the, the construction where you start from the unit interval, and then you remove one third of it, this, and then for any, any for the other remaining intervals, you remove one third, and you continue doing so infinitely many times. And what you're left with is like some kind of dust, like this, like just just a bunch of points. And actually, they're uncountable because you can sort of like build this tree and show that the number of points or the number of uh, Intervals that you have uh, grows exponentially, and so because it grows exponentially, the the cardinality of your final set is actually uh, uncountable, and it's also totally disconnected. So the, the, I, I, we won't talk about too much about the Cantor set here, but it's actually uh, a fairly common like counterexample or example of weird stuff in topology, and geometry in general also. Like Cantor set is a recurring character in topology for showing that some some property does not always hold. Anyway, so a nice thing that we can do with connectedness is that we can actually generalize the intermedi intermediate value theorem from classical analysis and it, it goes something like this. So if you have some connected topological space and a continuous function from this space to the real numbers, then if, if I have some points in my space A and B such that f of A is uh, smaller than f of B, then for any gamma between these two, f of A and f of B, I can always find some some point C in the original space such that f of C is equal to gamma. Because, right, uh, the interval f of A, f of B is connected in the usual topology, and because, um, like, the image of a connected space or a connected set is itself connected in the, in the output space, by sort of, by this argument, it's sort of immediate that we have this uh, 
intermediate value theorem, but in the general case, right? This could be completely diff completely different from any uh, like from from a Euclidean space, for example. So there is a weaker notion, technically, of uh, connectedness that's also closer to intuition is path connectedness. So we say that a set is path connected. If for any points in my space I can find a path, and a path is just a continuous function, uh, basically a curve that takes, so, so it goes from the interval 0 to 1 to x, and it just satisfies that uh, at 0 it, it's equal to x, and at 1 it's equal to y, and so we just, you can really imagine this being just a parameterized curve that uh, draws the, the path for your, uh, for your space. And so the um, my uh, space X is path connected if I can find such some, this path between any pair of points. And so I, okay, it's, it's actually stronger, not weaker than uh, connected. So path connected implies uh, connected, but uh, not the other way around. So I think the next slide I have some counter examples. So the first one is uh, so we take the unit square, but we don't equip it with the usual topology. We equip it with the so order topology associated with the lexicographic order. So if I have two points A and B, I define them to be smaller than C and, C and D. If either A is smaller than C or A is equal to C and B is smaller than D. And so you can like look at this little drawing here. Let's say that I have this point here A and B, and I'm drawing the set of all points that are smaller than A and B. So it involves all these sets on this line, so the, that's in the case so A is equal to C and B is smaller than D, and then it's all of this last part because it's smaller than A, or at least the first component is smaller than A. And then there's this sort of small strip on top of it that is um, not in this set. And the claim is that with the order topology, this set or this space here is connected, but it is not path connected. And so the reason why it's not path connected is because what would a like path between two points look like in this space? It's a bit complicated, but sort of, you could imagine if I was in the in the same slice, right? The path could be just something like this. But what happens between this, right? Because because the order of topology, I have to go like do one slice and then do another and you do another, and but there's like uncountably many slices that that you have to go through, and so. You can sort of feel why uh, building a, a path or a continuous path with this topology would be basically difficult. Another maybe uh, weaker example, it's called the topology sine curve, and it's defined as the graph of this function, so the sinus of one of a, one of uh, one over x. Right, and because we take the inverse of x, it's like you're compressing the whole uh, sine sinus curve um, like as, we, as we get closer to zero, and so like this function just like compresses and makes infinitely many oscillations as it, as it gets closer to zero. And if we take the graph, so literally all the points x and sine of one over x, and we take the closure of it. Right, because as we get closer to zero, the um, the oscillations just get infin infinitely. Uh, or, yeah, it, it oscillates infinitely, infinitely many times, and so that means that the at zero, the closure we have okay, the zero point, and then the interval, the interval minus one one, because right for any um, for any epsilon, there's going to be a, a, a one of these. Tiny, tiny oscillations that just get closer, so yeah, closer than epsilon to the to this interval. So this is another example of a se of a set that is connected but not path connected. And the reason it's not path connected is because what happens at the at the at zero. But I don't have a so so a really nice explanation for that one. Our um. Are topologies that are, you know, connected but not path connected like this, um, just kind of pathological counterexamples that, you know, a, 
a mathematician needs to be kind of like aware of or like I don't know like is this something that you know if you're working in a space that you really do need to work in but you don't necessarily understand super well you know like is this something that you actually need to check and be careful of and like something that comes up in practice or is, is it just kind of like you know be aware that these two things are not quite the same even though so I think both of these examples they're more like almost toy examples right so mm-hmm. like because topologists do like I think to to come up with the their counter examples and mm-hmm. and break things but actually the, the the second one I think it's very relevant to, so if you think about it, both of these are like kind of related to dimension mm-hmm. right because like the we have a curve, but then the the closure has like some does something funky with dimensions, or maybe it's like so something more like the dimensionality of the of this set. And I could I, I think some of these problems you can have the like the second example you can easily have with fractals. Mm. Right, you can have fractals that have some weird uh, topological properties. And like fractals appear in the real world, so it's so so whether or not you believe that you can like physically observe a, a proper fractal, um, you can definitely have these these kinds of problems with like actual sets you might you might meet or find in like some other problem, like maybe you're trying to look at some dy- dynamical system, and like the it does something chaotic and you have some kind of fractal object then you can have these kinds of problem gotcha okay yeah like i think uh probably like the like the lorenz attractor mm. like it's a very strange object that it's it's almost manifoldy but also fractally in a sense so mm-hmm. i'd expect this to have some kind of uh Gotcha. Something like this. Interesting. I guess I. Okay. Cool. Thank you. That's that's was yeah. Fair, that great answer. Appreciate that. Right. So that's uh, enough of um, connectedness to for today. So hope you enjoyed this little uh, appetizer. So we, now we're moving on to uh, separation axioms. So don't worry. We don't. We won't be delving too deep into it, like the, the really the main one you have to remember about is the Hausdorff, so T2, but it's useful to like look at these a little bit to, to show just that like you can really uh, sort of abstract many things and like like build these very very fine differences between properties and fine spaces that satisfy some of them and not all of them. So yeah, so let's start, for example, with the T0. So we'd say that a uh, topological space is T0, or Kolmogorov, uh, if you go by the thing on the right. If for any two points x and y, I can find an open set that either contains x and not y, or it contains y and not x. So here, the, the thing is that you do not have the choice. I can actually give an example for, of that one later, but it's a bit different than the, from the next one, T1, which says that for any two points, I can always find an open set that contains U and does not contain Y. So here I can always find this set. But here, it, like, it's a, slightly, uh, it's a bit weaker than the second one, T2, which is Hausdorff. And Hausdorff is the one that uh, it's, it's like the most, uh, is the one that most people use, or it is the most well-known even in applications. And a space is Hausdorff, or it's also called uh, separated. If, for any two points, I can find two open sets U and V, such that X is equal to U, is in U, Y is in V, and their intersection is empty. So I can always uh, yeah, just draw, find open sets uh, around these, that sort of separate them, right? You can, you can imagine this is this being about uh, a classification problem, right? You want to be able to separate your points. Well, here we can. 
and for example as one property any metric space it's trivially separable right because you can you just could you just take arbitrary small ball, small enough balls and um, yeah just take a, a ball smaller than like the distance between these two same for the other end, and you get uh, this property uh, yeah so, so for example so for example uh, i said it's t3 or regular if for any x any point x any any closed set f such that x is not an f i can also separate my point x and my closed set f then t4 it's a bit stronger again is that any pair of closed sets i can separate so notice that we have this uh, different notions and again they're not always equivalent for the Euclidean spaces for example it's uh, at least you yeah Euclidean space or Hausdorff but I don't think they're normal because you can find like some complicated normal sets or, uh, some complicated closed sets sorry so why should you care about Hausdorff space so I mentioned it's about like isolating points and being able to re, re pin down any point and not having any extra extra baggage left to it. So there's like a few characterizations of this. Only that okay, X is Hausdorff if the diagonal map, so delta X, which simply maps a point X to the pair XX, this has to be a closed set in the like product topology. And this is subtle, but again, it's the same point of you're really able to distinguish any points using your topology. Right? There's no uh, two points that are confused or um, what would be the word? Um, I guess confused is probably the best one. Uh, or yeah, no, sorry, I don't, I don't have the, I don't find any word right now. So. I mentioned also that Hausdorff is not just that, it really has, it really has a lot of, uh, like, Hausdorff space are, are usually you, you want to work in Hausdorff space because they have a nice, a lot of nice properties. For example, if I have um, a Hausdorff space Y and some arbitrary topological space X and some, like, two, two um, functions, continuous function X to Y, if they're equal on some dense subset of x, then actually they have to be equal on all x. So we have this sort of nice property that if I know the value of my function on some dense subset, for example, if I only know the value of my function on the on the rational numbers and it's continuous, right? Only knowing the, the value of my function on the rational numbers, which even though it's a, just a countable subset, because it's dense in R, right? It completely characterizes the value of my function over the real numbers. So this is also like important for approximation properties, right? Because if you want to compute things, you cannot compute arbitrary real numbers. You can, you 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 have to just deal with numbers you can compute. And so because we can compute rational numbers, in some sense we can also compute continuous functions on the real numbers by just looking at the uh, their value on the on the rationals. Another theme, and this one is really important, is that uh, so in a Hausdorff space, any sequence, if it has a limit, it's unique. So this is uh, very important because by the default uh, definition uh, definition of topology in sequence, you do not get that, right? You can uh, you can get function you can uh, you can have sequences that have multiple limits. But in Hausdorff spaces, right, because you can always distinguish any two points, uh, the limit is always unique, if it exists. So that's 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 the everything for, I have for Hausdorff space. Uh, there was quite a lot more in the in the reading, but in the interest of time, I won't be covering it today. So the the final topic for today is compactness. And so the definition of compact or of a compact set is if you have an open cover, so like a cover of my topology space, just a collection of subsets such that their union is X. And if uh, uh, if my subsets are open sets, then I have a, what's called an open cover. And then a sub cover is just any subset of my cover that also uh, is that also still uh, covers my space. 
And so we see that a topological space X is compact if every open cover has a finite subcover. So remember I mentioned that we have some finite description. This is one example of it, right, because like you can think of your cover as some description of your space using smaller like puzzle pieces, right? You just have small pieces of your space that you, you use to look at it. And here compact means that I can always find some finite number of, of pieces that tell me everything about my space, or at least everything from my cover. Okay, that's sort of a, another um, characterization in terms of closed set using what's called the finite intersection property. So uh, a subset, uh, a collection of subset of X has the finite intersection property if any finite intersection of these uh, of element of this set is non empty. And then the, the characterization is that X is compact if any collection of subsets that has the finite intersection property has um, so the intersection of all of these uh, subsets is also non empty. So that's another characterization, but probably not as useful as the first one. So Let's give some examples. So first of all, any finite space is compact, right? Because any finite space, there's only finitely many points. So uh, I, by all, I only need finitely many, se finitely many sets in my cover to completely cover it. So obvious. Uh, the trivial topological space is compact, right? Because there are only two, only have two open sets. So again, fairly quickly, you get everything. Um, here we get an, uh, an example of why Hausdorff is nice, right? Any compact subspace of a Hausdorff space is closed. So we'll see in a minute why, uh, well, actually right now, why that is important, for example. For the real numbers, and really the, the Euclidean spaces in general, at least in finite dimensions, a compact set or a compact subset of R is just a closed and bounded. So closed, I think you know what it means by now, but bounded, it just means that like I can find some radius r such that the any element of my, my compact set is has uh, is within r of the the unit. Sorry, the uh, I guess it is zero, right? So bounded just means that it does not go to infinity. And this is another example of, uh, or another thing, intuition you can have about compact set, right? If something is compact, you cannot run off to infinity or diverge in any way. You just sort of have to stay within some small region. So to give you an example, the unit circle S1, right, it's compact. And this is also related to, like, when you had, like, compact groups and locally compact groups in... Um, when we talked about representation theory, this is very much uh, this notion of compact, but when you have uh, also a group that is uh, continuous with respect to the topology. Another nice example, simply the unit interval Z1, closed interval, right, because in, in, we're in uh, the real numbers, it also has to be compact. Okay, let me quickly have a drink. Okay, so let's talk about some properties. So, and first of all, as we've connected uh, spaces, the um, the image of a compact space through a continuous function is also a compact subspace in the output space. Uh, another nice one is that if X is compact and I have a closed subset of X, then A is also a compact subspace. I think that might be in the house of case probably. Um, another nice thing, right, if I have a compact space X and some Hausdorff space Y and the continuous function from X to Y, then continuous bijection, then automatically F is a homeomorphism, right? right? So just by having this compact and Hausdorff structure, immediately I have that uh, any continuous bijection, so remember, right, uh, it's continuous one way, but like the inverse might not, might not be continuous. But actually, if we have these two properties, then it's always the case. Okay. 
So, uh, so the, another really useful theorem from classical analysis that also gets um, generalized in using compactness is that if I, have a, if I have a compact space and some continuous function from x to r, then uh, my function will reach its limits on the space. So what that means is that I can find some a and b in my space such that f of a is the smallest, so infimum, really the minimum value of my function, and same thing b is the supremum, or really the maximum value of my function. So my function reaches its bounds on this compact set. Okay, so at this point there's like a, a couple of like related notion to compact notions related to compactness. One of them is uh, sequential compactness, and the other one is limit point compactness. So a space X is limit point compact if every infinite subset has a limit point. Maybe not the most interesting for now, but the, the other one is actually very important. We'll say that X is sequentially compact if every sequence in X has a convergent, convergent subsequence. So yeah, right, you, you might remember this as the hein borel theorem. So sequential compactness is sort of the general notion of, of that. And I think I have a characterization of it uh, in the slides there, yeah, in the coming slide. So one thing is that yeah, the finite property, finite products of compact spaces are compact. At least in the finite, fi like finite products, that's easy, and actually even infinite products. Uh, so I remember last time I mentioned that for the product topology on in, uh, like infinitely many spaces, we had to be careful. And actually the reason why you had to be careful is precisely so that uh, this product was compact if I had compact spaces in my product. Okay, again, don't hesitate if you have any questions. Okay, so as with uh, many properties, right, we, we want to be able to talk about something being local. Maybe it's not true for the whole space, but some, like for some, around some point, like for the neighborhood, it's at that point it might be true. So this is also the case for compactness. We have this notion of local compactness. And a space is locally compact at some point x if I can find a compact subset that contains a neighborhood. So I can find a compact neighborhood of my space, of my point. And so the set, the, the space x is locally compact if it is locally compact at every point x. Uh, for example, like Rn, the Euclidean space, it is locally compact, but it is not compact itself. Because right, because R n I can like go to infinity or like escape to infinity, so it's not compact. But it is locally compact. But on the other hand, um, the rational numbers they're not compact and they're also not locally compact. Okay, so one property is that we have some locally compact Hausdorff space and some points. Then every neighborhood of X contains a compact neighborhood of X. Of X. So again, this comes in very handy when you want to approximate points in your space. Having these compact sets is really uh, useful. Okay, so that's one nice thing you can do with uh, some space. So let's say you have a lo locally host of, uh, sorry, locally compact host of space. Then I can actually make it into a compact space by adding just a single point. So right, the idea is that you add a point infinity, so really it should be some arbitrary point, not an x, and you define a new topology on it, on on this augmented space, where it's either all the old open sets of your topology. So, yeah, the open sets that were, that were previously in my topology, or I'm taking the complements of compact subsets of my old topology. Note that because I'm taking the complement, right? Any of these sets will contain this point at infinity. And actually, this topology, so it is a compact Hausdorff space. And moreover, it's also the only topology that makes this uh, augmented set compact. And Hausdorff 
and that also agrees with the old topology. Um, uh, like when you remove these uh, weird sets. So let's give one example. So I mentioned that the real numbers were not compact, but they are locally compact. And so let's look at augmenting the real numbers with this point and infinity. And I'm abusing notation, but right, the topology. I have my old open sets, right? The just open intervals, and then I have sort of these complements of open intervals, or complements of closed intervals that are like minus infinity a and union b plus infinity. And the abuse is that I'm talking about minus infinity plus infinity, but like these are sets that contain the infinity, so that like they go as far, uh, yeah, they go arbitrarily uh, far. And so it's easy to 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 see that this uh, like using this I get a, a compact topology because any open cover must contain at least one of these open sets, right? And so the rest of it, because I have an, an open cover, I have okay at least one of these. And then because it's an open cover, I have I need to have the rest of the space, but the rest of the space is just a compact set in my old topology, and so because this is a compact set in my old topology, I must be able to find a finite subcover that covers this, and so I take this sub -cover, the subcover of this part plus this, the one open set that I must have, and so I have a finite subcover of my augmented real numbers, and it turns out actually that the, this sort of uh, compact, compactified real numbers, it's actually equivalent to the, the circle. So you can sort of see it by this diagram where I have my unit circle and I have like this bijection where I project right so I start from this point on the north pole and I project it on the real line so I have like this correspondence between points on the circles and point on the real line and this point in infinity it sort of like gets mapped to like the infinity of the real number so it just gets arbitrary far because this sort of builds a bijection and again like these right so these open sets that contain infinity they must like correspond to some subset of these so it's in or it's this kind of set so you can see that it's actually the same or at least intuitively should be the same Okay, so that was a lot of things about compactness in sort of general topological spaces, but in machine learning we usually work with metric spaces, and so in, in this case there are actually quite a lot of uh, nice properties related to compactness. So first of all, right, remember that in metric space we have this notion of a Cauchy sequence, that okay, a sequence is Cauchy if uh, for any epsilon I can find some integer n epsilon, so that's for any mn greater than n epsilon, the distance between the points on my sequences on, on my, in my sequence is smaller than epsilon, so the like the the points in the sequence get closer and closer to each other, and uh, this sort of brings uh, an important property about metric spaces that a metric space is going to be, is going to be complete if every Cauchy sequence is convergent, right? Because you can imagine something like the rational numbers that are their a topological space and I can have metric on it, but I can find sequences of rational numbers that converge to uh, something that is not rational. And so this kind of sequence is going to be Cauchy but not convergent. And so that, like when you have a sequence that's Cauchy but does not converge, that sort of tells you that's like a hole, a missing point in your space. And so we usually want to work with space where there are no holes. So that's why we, we care about completeness. So if we define uh, also the, the notion of total boundedness, so remember in Euclidean space, uh, it was for a, spa uh, for a set to be compact, it was enough for it to be closed and bounded. For general metric spaces, uh, bounded is not enough, so we need total boundedness. So uh, space is totally bounded if for any epsilon I can cover my space with finitely many epsilon balls. So 
the reason um, this was not important in in Euclidean space is that in finite dimensional Euclidean spaces, bounded is equivalent to totally bounded, so not a problem. So we have a theorem that if I have a metric space, then all of the following properties are equivalent. So first of all, x is compact. This is equivalent to x being limit point compact. It's also equivalent to being sequentially compact. So like depending on my application, it might be easier to show one of the like sequentially compact, for example. And it's also equivalent to x being complete and totally bounded. So like this theorem is fairly powerful because if you have a metric space, you can choose between between these properties to show that your space is compact. Okay, so a, a corollary of this is that if my space is compact, then for any epsilon greater than zero, I can there can only be finitely many points points in my space x or x one to x n such that the pairwise distance between any any two of these points is greater than epsilon. This is most useful when we actually when you want to, when you ah, sorry when you want to prove that the space is not compact, and you do that by just okay like maybe pick one or pick some number and just show that you can find infinitely many points such that there are distances the power distance is greater than epsilon. So in some way you can like embed any. Um, I mean I like, I like to think of it as saying you can embed like the the natural numbers or some kind of thing like this. Like the, the, we, we, we did something like this in the functional analysis reading group. But anyway, so some other properties. Every isometry, so uh, an isometry is just a, a function that like, does not change the metric. Any isometry is on a compact compact metric space is also a, homeom a homeomorphic. If it's not compact, it's at least continuous. And then because it's compact, it's also homeomorphic. Then I think the 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 yeah the reading had this was saying that every metric space is locally compact, but I'm pretty sure that's wrong because at least for in like infinity di uh, infinite dimensional uh, function spaces it's not true. So that's one one thing one place where I think the the reading was just straight up wrong. So yeah, sorry for the slightly more confused slides than last time, but. That's all I had for today, so any questions? For... So for like an infinite dimensional fun, like, is... Can you have a locally compact infinite dimensional like functions space like is 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 there something about infinite dimensions and compactness that is just they just do not go together at all or um i think you can probably find at least one example of like an infinite dimensional like function or vector space that is locally compact but for for the ones people care about, like the, like say a Hilbert space, like mm -hmm. let's say the Hilbert space of L2 sequences, mm -hmm. uh, it's truly not uh, locally compact because you can embed, um, like if you look at the unit ball, so you, you might want the, the, yeah, so the, like, yeah, the unit, the closed unit ball in L2, it is not a compact subset even though it's like mm -hmm. close and bounded and the reason for for that is that you can actually embed like if you take the sequence one and then many zeros and right, so you take all the one hot sequences like these are all in the in this unit ball but notice that they they all have the same distance to one another and so mm. it's like a counter it's a counterexample of this corollary that basically tells you that okay, the, I can embed, um, I can have the infinite sequence of of points in in the set that all have the same distance to one another, and so it cannot be compact. So this thing cannot be compact, right? And so 
because this would be like the natural object for a for a, a neighborhood it sort of shows that it's it's not locally compact though you like you can have you can have compact subsets in in l2 or in, in function spaces but they're mm -hmm. like they're, they're not uh, they're not so trivial to have. Gotcha. I mean, I now, I feel like next time, um, this is actually help, you know, I mean, this is a very small thing, but, you know, next next time we're talking about um, uh, Fourier transforms on groups and someone asks, you know, like, because, because the definition is always like, if you have a locally compact abelian group, um, you know, uh, then you can do the Fourier transform. And, pe and someone always pipes in and asks, like, well, why, why locally compact? Like, what does that mean? Like, what is, you know, and I, and I have always kind of struggled to think of an answer of, like, what would be a good something that isn't, like, what would be a good group that isn't locally compact? Um, and it's like, na now I can see that it's like the diffeomorphism group of, you know, a manifold or something like that, um, which would be infinite dimensional and almost certainly not locally compact and like, you know, God help you if you tried to like put a har measure on that. Um, so yeah, cool. You're welcome. Anything else? I, I think we lost a few people along the way. It was, it does get a little hairy in there. And yeah, little, I mean, it, it was tough to like, I had to cut out a bunch of things because if I figured okay, people would just fall over dead if I just blasted mm -hmm. all of, all of the the properties. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think like if if we remember, like if you guys remember, just like the intuition about house door being the fact that you can isolate any points with mm -hmm. your with with the, using the topology and. Compactness telling you that you can like approximate and do that with finitely many steps. That's like the I, I think those are like the the two mo most more important more uh, the two most important takeaways. But definitely like uh, mm -hmm. because topology has like yeah. abstracted gone all the way on the abstraction of this. Mm -hmm. There are always like weird example counter examples and sets that are yeah. nasty. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wonder whether or not you know. I mean, I don't know. Like, w there's there's so much to do. There's so much to talk about. Um, but like, I was thinking about. I think it was Hawk's feedback that you know some of like what we've been talking about has felt unmotivated. You know, but like after this, I feel I feel like a week or two on on like topological data analysis would be would be pretty cool. Um, Might be cool, but, but it would also take us in like a completely different um, direction. Yeah. But yeah, maybe. yeah, yeah. I don't know, but I don't know. I I still really appreciated this. This is you know like it is it it is really abstract, but it's so it's. It, it, but I then again, know, like Hausdorff like, and Compact, they they're always there. Like they're, they're just like the the magical the incantation that just people sprinkling, sprinkling it's everywhere. The, it's the bedrock of every optimization problem. You know, it's the bedrock of, um, like yeah, ju just you know when, you know. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Like every everything that you end up doing practically with, you know, machine learning, statistical learning, has, you know, stuff like this at the very very heart of it, um, and yeah, I don't know. So it's, I'm I'm glad that I'm glad that we're going over it. It's a very very helpful review. Okay then. Uh... Are there any, any other questions? Yeah, I'm probably going to have to rewatch parts of this talk uh, because uh, at a few points I noticed my, myself just glazing over and yeah, sure. hearing the words. Don't, don't hesitate to uh, also discuss it because it probably wasn't super clear in some parts also. 
uh, yeah, and I guess if there are no other questions, um, we need to talk about uh, next time. So next mm -hmm. Sunday, I I won't be there because I'll be on a in a conference. So uh, I guess probably next week we we won't have a, we uh, we don't we won't have a session. So in two weeks mm -hmm. we we have a session to do, but I don't think we have anything scheduled yet. So I think maybe Honglu was uh, thinking of covering. Uh, I guess either singular learning theory or at least some of. Uh, I yeah, I guess it depends on what you guys want to hear. I, I, I think we had yeah, discussed so my, this. Sorry. Yeah, my original thought was some more theory because <laughs> I mm -hmm. kept promoting this thing. Right. It has to do with all the um, all those topology stuff would be dry without examples, but more theory has a lot of examples in it and cool drawings, mm -hmm. and also it kind of has kind of has to do with those singularity learning theory. It actually talks about special case that the theory doesn't cover. <laughs> with, mm. um, they, they. Uh, I think I, I've been reading a little bit of those stuff, and they they cover some hard stuff that is not touched by Morse theory, <laughs> unfortunately. Mm. But they kind of share a common ground, and that's like um, um, a place where uh, where I can actually draw pictures. <laughs> cool. Mm -hmm. And yeah, w will you be willing to like talk about Morse theory in two weeks? Yeah, uh, in two weeks. Oh, sure, absolutely. Yeah, I will have time. Perfect. Then I guess that's. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Cool. Then thank you very much for that, and we'll see how it happens. So, yeah, thanks everyone for yeah. sticking out uh, this long and bearing with my maybe a bit, little bit confused presentation. And yeah. All right. Yeah. Thank you so much. See you all in uh, two weeks. Yeah. Bye.